ticket, looks at me and waves goodbye. I raise my hand to wave back and discover I'm still holding the cigar he gave me. I put it in my suit jacket pocket. When I look up again, he's gone. An impatient gate agent appears and tells me flatly she is going to close the door. Chapter 5 It's a good cigar. For a connoisseur of tobacco, it might be a little dry, since it spent several weeks inside my suit jacket. But I smoke it with pleasure during Peach's big meeting, while I remember that other, stranger meeting with Jonah. Or was it really more strange than this? Peach is up in front of us, tapping the center of a graph with a long wood pointer. Smoke whirls slowly in the beam of the slide projector. Across from me, someone is poking earnestly at a calculator. Everyone except me is listening intently, or jotting notes, or offering comments. I have no idea what's going on. Their words sound like a different language to me. Not a foreign language exactly, but a language I once knew and only vaguely now recall. The terms seem familiar to me, but now I'm not sure what they really mean. They're just words. You're just playing a lot of games with numbers and words. For a few minutes there in Chicago's O'Hare, I did try to think about what Jonah had said. He'd made a lot of sense to me somehow. He had some good points. But it was like somebody from a different world had talked to me. I had to shrug it off. I had to go to Houston and talk about robots. It was time to catch my own plane. Now I'm wondering if Jonah might be closer to the truth than I first thought. Because as I glance from face to face, I get this gut hunch that none of us here has anything more than a witch doctor's understanding of the medicine we're practicing. Our tribe is dying, and we're dancing in our ceremonial smoke to exorcise the devil that's ailing us. What is the real goal? Nobody here has even asked anything that basic. Peach is chanting about cost opportunities and productivity targets and so on. Hilton Smythe is saying hallelujah to whatever Peach proclaims. Does anyone genuinely understand what we're doing? At ten o'clock, Peach calls a break. Everyone except me exits for the restrooms or for coffee. I stay seated until they are out of the room. What the hell am I doing here? I'm wondering what good it is for me, or any of us, to be sitting here in this room. Is this meeting, which is scheduled to last for most of the day, going to make my plant competitive? save my job, or help anybody to do anything of benefit to anyone? I can't handle it. I don't even know what productivity is. So how can this be anything except a total waste? And with that thought, I find myself stuffing my papers back into my briefcase. I snap it closed. And then I quietly get up and walk out. I'm lucky at first. I make it to the elevator without anyone saying anything to me. But while I'm waiting there... Hilton Smythe comes strolling past. You're not bailing out on us, are you, Al? For a second, I consider ignoring the question, but then I realize Smythe might deliberately say something to Peach. Have to. I've got a situation that needs my attention back at the plant. What? An emergency? You can call it that. The elevator opens its doors. I step in. Smythe is looking at me with a quizzical expression as he walks by. The doors close. It crosses my mind that there is a risk of Peach firing me for walking out of his meeting, but that, to my current frame of mind as I walk through the garage to my car, would only shorten three months of anxiety leading up to what I suspect might be inevitable. I don't go back to the plant right away. I drive around for a while. I point the car down one road and follow it until I'm tired of it, and then take another road. A couple of hours pass. I don't care where I am. I just want to be out. The freedom is kind of exhilarating, until it gets boring. As I'm driving, I try to keep my mind off business. I try to clear my head. The day has turned out to be nice. The sun is out. It's warm. No clouds. Blue sky. Even though the land still has an early spring austerity, everything yellow-brown, it's a good day to be playing hooky. I remember looking at my watch just before I reached the plant gates and seeing that it's past 1 p.m., I'm slowing down to make the turn through the gate when, I don't know how else to say it, it just doesn't feel right. I look at the plant, and I put my foot down on the gas and keep going. I'm hungry. I'm thinking maybe I should get some lunch. But I guess the real reason is I just don't want to be found yet. I need to think, and I'll never be able to do it if I go back to the office now. 
Up the road about a mile is a little pizza place. I see they're open, so I stop and go in. I'm conservative. I get a medium pizza with double cheese, pepperoni, sausage, mushrooms, green peppers, hot peppers, black olives, and onion, and... Hmm, a sprinkling of anchovies. While I'm waiting, I can't resist the munchos on the stand by the cash register, and I tell the Sicilian who runs the place to put me down for a couple of bags of beer nuts, some taco chips, and, for later, some pretzels. Trauma whets my appetite. But there's one problem. You just can't wash down beer nuts with soda. You need beer. And guess what I see in the cooler? Of course, I don't usually drink during the day, but I look at the way the light is hitting those frosty cold cans. Screw it. I pull out a six of Bud. $14.62, and I'm out of there. Just before the plant, on the opposite side of the highway, there is a gravel road leading up a low hillside. It's an access road to a substation about half a mile away. So, on impulse, I turn the wheel sharply. The Buick goes bouncing off the highway and onto the gravel, and only a fast hand saves my pizza from the floor. We raise some dust getting to the top. I park the car, unbutton my shirt, take off my tie and coat to save them from the inevitable, and open up my goodies. Some distance below, down across the highway, is my plant. It sits in a field, a big gray steel box without windows. Inside, I know, there are about 400 people at work on day shift. Their cars are parked in the lot. I watch as a truck backs between two others sitting at the unloading docks. The trucks bring the materials which the machines and people inside will use to make something. On the opposite side, more trucks are being filled with what they have produced. In simplest terms, that's what's happening. I'm supposed to manage what goes on down there. I pop the top on one of the beers and go to work on the pizza. The plant has the look of a landmark. It's as if it has always been there. As if it will always be there. I happen to know the plant is only about 15 years old, and it may not be here as many years from now. So, what is the goal? What are we supposed to be doing here? What keeps this place working? Jonas said there was only one goal. Well, I don't see how that can be. We do a lot of things in the course of daily operations, and they're all important, most of them anyway, or we wouldn't do them. What the hell? They all could be goals. I mean, for instance, one of the things a manufacturing organization must do is buy raw materials. They need these materials in order to manufacture, and we have to obtain them at the best cost. And so, purchasing in a cost-effective manner is very important to us. The pizza, by the way, is primo. I'm chowing down on my second piece when some tiny voice inside my head asks me, But is this the goal? Is cost-effective purchasing the reason for the plant's existence? <laughs> I have to laugh. I almost choke. Yeah, right. Some of the brilliant idiots in purchasing sure do act as if that's the goal. They're out there renting warehouses to store all the crap they're buying so cost-effectively. What is it we have now? A 32-month supply of copper wire? A seven-month inventory of stainless steel sheet? All kinds of stuff. They've got millions and millions tied up in what they've bought, and at terrific prices. No, put it that way, and economical purchasing is definitely not the goal of this plant. What else do we do? We employ people, by the hundreds here and by the tens of thousands throughout Unico. We, the people, are supposed to be Unico's most important asset, as some PR flack worded it once in an annual report. Brush off the bull, and it is true the company couldn't function without good people of various skills and professions. I personally am glad it provides jobs. There is a lot to be said for a steady paycheck. But supplying jobs to people surely isn't why the plant exists. After all, how many people have we laid off so far? And anyway, even if Unico offered lifetime employment like some of the Japanese companies, I still couldn't say the goal is jobs. A lot of people seem to think and act as if that were the goal, empire-building department managers and politicians just to name two. But the plant wasn't built for the purpose of paying wages and giving people something to do. Okay, so why was the plant built in the first place? It was built to produce products. Why can't that be the goal? Jonah said it wasn't. But I don't see why it isn't the goal. We're a manufacturing company. That means we have to manufacture something, doesn't it? 
Isn't that the whole point? To produce products? Why else are we here? I think about some of the buzzwords I've been hearing lately. What about quality? Maybe that's it. If you don't manufacture a quality product, all you've got at the end is a bunch of expensive mistakes. You have to meet the customer's requirements with a quality product, or before long, you won't have a business. Unico learned its lesson on that point. But we've already learned that lesson. We've implemented a major effort to improve quality. Why isn't the plant's future secure? And if quality were truly the goal, then how come a company like Rolls-Royce very nearly went bankrupt? Quality alone cannot be the goal. It's important, but it's not the goal. Why? Because of costs? If low-cost production is essential, then efficiency would seem to be the answer. Okay, maybe it's the two of them together, quality and efficiency. They do tend to go hand in hand. The fewer errors made, the less rework you have to do, which can lead to lower costs and so on. Maybe that's what Jonah meant. Producing a quality product efficiently, that must be the goal. It sure sounds good. Quality and efficiency. Those are two nice words, kind of like motherhood in the American way. I sit back and pop the top on another beer. The pizza is now just a fond memory. For a few moments, I feel satisfied. But something isn't sitting right and it's more than just indigestion from lunch. To efficiently produce quality products sounds like a good goal, but can that goal keep the plant working? I'm bothered by some of the examples that come to mind. If the goal is to produce a quality product efficiently, then how come Volkswagen still isn't making bugs? That was a quality product that could be produced at low cost. Or, going back a ways, how come Douglas didn't keep making DC-3s? From everything I've heard, the DC-3 was a fine aircraft. I'll bet if they had kept making them, they could turn them out today a lot more efficiently than DC-10s. It's not enough to turn out a quality product on an efficient basis. The goal has to be something else. But what? As I drink my beer, I find myself contemplating the smooth finish of the aluminum beer can I hold in my hand. Mass production technology really is something. To think that this can, until recently, was a rock in the ground. Then we come along with some know-how and some tools and turn the rock into a lightweight, workable metal that you can use over and over again. It's pretty amazing. Wait a minute, I'm thinking. That's it. Technology. That's really what it's all about. We have to stay on the leading edge of technology. It's essential to the company. If we don't keep pace with technology, we're finished. So that's the goal. Well, on second thought, that isn't right. If technology is the real goal of the manufacturing organization, then how come the most responsible positions aren't in research and development? How come R&D is always off to the side in every organization chart I've ever seen? And suppose we did have the latest of every kind of machine we could use. Would it save us? No, it wouldn't. So technology is important, but it isn't the goal. Maybe the goal is some combination of efficiency, quality, and technology. But then I'm back to saying we have a lot of important goals. And that really isn't saying anything, aside from the fact that it doesn't square with what Jonah told me. I'm stumped. I gaze down the hillside. In front of the big steel box of the plant, there is a smaller box of glass and concrete which houses the offices. Mine is the office on the front left corner. Squinting at it, I can almost see the stack of phone messages my secretary is bringing in my wheelbarrow. Oh, well. I lift my beer for a good long slug. And as I tilt my head back, I see them. Out beyond the plant are two other long, narrow buildings. There are warehouses. They're filled to the roof with spare parts and unsold merchandise we haven't been able to unload yet. Twenty million dollars in finished goods inventory. Quality products of the most current technology, all produced efficiently, all sitting in their boxes, all sealed in plastic with the warranty cards and a whiff of the original factory air, and all waiting for someone to buy them. So that's it. Unico obviously doesn't run this plant just to fill a warehouse. The goal is sales. But if the goal is sales, why didn't Jonah accept market share as the goal? Market share is even more important as a goal than sales. If you have the highest market share, you've got the best sales in your industry. Capture the market, and you've got it made, don't you? Maybe not. I remember the old line, we're losing money, but we're going to make it up with volume. 
a company will sometimes sell at a loss or at a small amount over cost, as Unico has been known to do, just to unload inventories. You can have a big share of the market, but if you're not making money, who cares? Money. Well, of course. Money is the big thing. Peach is going to shut us down because the plant is costing the company too much money. So I have to find ways to reduce the money that the company is losing. Wait a minute. Suppose I did some incredibly brilliant thing and stemmed the losses so we broke even. Would that save us? Not in the long run, it wouldn't. The plant wasn't built just so it could break even. Unico is not in business just so it can break even. The company exists to make money. I see it now. The goal of the manufacturing organization is to make money. Why else did J. Bartholomew Granby start his company back in 1881 and go to market with his improved coal stove? Was it for the love of appliances? Was it a magnanimous public gesture to bring warmth and comfort to millions? Hell no! Old J. Bart did it to make a bundle, and he succeeded, because the stove was a gem of a product in its day. And then investors gave him more money so they could make a bundle, and J. Bart could make an even bigger one. But is making money the only goal? What are all these other things I've been worrying about? I reach for my briefcase, take out a yellow legal pad, and take a pen from my coat pocket. Then I make a list of all the items people think of as being goals. Cost-effective purchasing, employing good people, high technology, producing products, producing quality products, selling quality products, capturing market share. I even add some others like communications and customer satisfaction. All of those are essential to running the business successfully. What do they all do? They enable the company to make money, but they are not the goals themselves. They're just the means of achieving the goal. How do I know for sure? Well, I don't. Not absolutely. But adopting making money as the goal of a manufacturing organization looks like a pretty good assumption. Because for one thing, there isn't one item on that list that's worth a damn if the company isn't making money. Because what happens if a company doesn't make money? If the company doesn't make money by producing and selling products, or by maintenance contracts, or by selling some of its assets, or by some other means, the company is finished. It will cease to function. Money must be the goal. Nothing else works in its place. Anyway, that's the one assumption I have to make. If the goal is to make money, then, putting it in terms Jonah might have used, an action that moves us toward making money is productive. And an action that takes us away from making money is non-productive. For the past year or more, the plant has been moving away from the goal more than toward it. So to save the plant, I have to make it productive. I have to make the plant make money for Unico. That's a simplified statement of what's happening, but it's accurate. At least it's a logical starting point. Through the windshield, the world is bright and cold. The sunlight seems to have become much more intense. I look around as if I've just come out of a long trance. Everything is familiar, but seems new to me. I take my last swallow of beer. I suddenly feel I have to get going. Chapter 6 By my watch, it's about 4.30 when I park the Buick in the plant lot. One thing I've effectively managed today is to evade the office. I reach for my briefcase and get out of the car. The glass box of the office in front of me is silent as death, like an ambush. I know they're all inside waiting for me, waiting to pounce. I decide to disappoint everyone. I decide to take a detour through the plant. I just want to take a fresh look at things. I walk down to a door into the plant and go inside. From my briefcase, I get the safety glasses I always carry. There is a rack of hard hats by one of the desks over by the wall. I steal one from there, put it on, and walk inside. As I round a corner and enter one of the work areas, I happen to surprise three guys sitting on a bench in one of the open bays. They're sharing a newspaper, reading and talking with each other. One of them sees me. He nudges the others. The newspaper is folded away with the grace of a snake disappearing in the grass. All three of them nonchalantly become purposeful and go off in three separate directions. I might have walked on by another time, but today it makes me mad. Damn it, the hourly people know this plant is in trouble. With the layoffs we've had, they have to know. You'd think they'd all try to work harder to save this place, but here we've got three guys, all of them making probably 10 or 12 bucks an hour, sitting on their asses. I go and find their supervisor. 
After I tell him that three of his people are sitting around with nothing to do, he gives me some excuse about how they're mostly caught up on their quotas and they're waiting for more parts. So I tell him, if you can't keep them working, I'll find a department that can. Now find something for them to do. You use your people or lose them. You got it? From down the aisle, I look over my shoulder. The super now has the three guys moving some materials from one side of the aisle to the other. I know it's probably just something to keep them busy, but what the hell. At least those guys are working. If I hadn't said something, who knows how long they'd have sat there. Then it occurs to me, those three guys are doing something now, but is that going to help us make money? They might be working, but are they productive? For a moment, I consider going back and telling the supervisor to make those guys actually produce. But, well, maybe there really isn't anything for them to work on right now. And even though I could perhaps have those guys shifted to some place where they could produce, how would I know if that work is helping us make money? That's a weird thought. Can I assume that making people work and making money are the same thing? We've tended to do that in the past. The basic rule has been just keep everybody and everything out here working all the time. Keep pushing that product out the door. And when there isn't any work to do, make some. And when we can't make work, shift people around. And when you still can't make them work, lay them off. I look around and most people are working. Idle people in here are the exception. Just about everybody is working nearly all the time. And we're not making money. Some stairs zigzag up one of the walls, access to one of the overhead cranes. I climb them until I am halfway to the roof and can look out over the plant from one of the landings. Every moment, lots and lots of things are happening down there. Practically everything I'm seeing is a variable. The complexity in this plant, in any manufacturing plant, is mind-boggling if you contemplate it. Situations on the floor are always changing. How can I possibly control what goes on? How the hell am I supposed to know if any action in the plant is productive or non-productive toward making money? The answer is supposed to be in my briefcase, which is heavy in my hand. It's filled with all those reports and printouts and stuff that Lou gave me for the meeting. We do have lots of measurements that are supposed to tell us if we're productive. But what they really tell us are things like whether somebody down there worked for all the hours we paid him or her to work. They tell us whether the output per hour met our standard for the job. They tell us the cost of products. They tell us direct labor variances. All that stuff. But how do I really know if what happens here is making money for us or whether we're just playing accounting games? There must be a connection, but how do I define it? I shuffle back down the stairs. Maybe I should just dash off a blistering memo on the evil of reading newspapers on the job. Think that'll put us back in the black? By the time I finally set foot inside my office, it's past five o'clock and most of the people who might have been waiting for me are gone. Fran was probably one of the first ones out the door, but she has left me all their messages. I can barely see the phone under them. Half of the messages seem to be from Bill Peach. I guess he caught my disappearing act. With reluctance, I pick up the phone and dial his number. But God is merciful. It rings for a straight two minutes. No answer. I breathe quietly and hang up. Sitting back in my chair, looking out at the reddish gold of late afternoon, I keep thinking about measurements, about all the ways we use to evaluate performance, meeting schedules and due dates, inventory turns, total sales, total expenses. Is there a simplified way to know if we're making money? There's a soft knock at the door. I turn. It's Lou. As I mentioned earlier, Lou is the plant controller. He's a paunchy, older man who's about two years away from retirement. In the best accountant's tradition, he wears horn-rimmed bifocal glasses. Even though he dresses in expensive suits, somehow he always seems to look a little frumpled. He came here from corporate about 20 years ago. His hair is snow white. I think his reason for living is to go to the CPA conventions and bust loose. Most of the time, he's very mild-mannered until you try and put something over on him. Then he turns into Godzilla. I... I roll my hand, motioning him to come in. Just wanted to mention to you that Bill Peach called this afternoon. Weren't you supposed to be in a meeting with him today? What did Bill want? He needed some kind of updates on some figures. He seemed kind of miffed that you weren't here. Did you get him what he needed? Yeah, most of it. I sent it to him. He should get it in the morning. Most of it was like the stuff I gave you. What about the rest? Just a few things I have to pull together. I should have it sometime tomorrow. 
Let me see it before it goes, okay? Just so I know. Oh, sure. Hey, you got a minute? Yeah, what's up? Sit down. I think for a second, trying to phrase this correctly. Lou waits expectantly. This is just a simple, fundamental question. Those are the kind I like. Would you say the goal of this company is to make money? <laughs> are you kidding? Is this a trick question? No, no. Just tell me. Of course, it's to make money. So, the goal of the company is to make money, right? Yeah, we have to produce products too. Okay, now wait a minute. Producing products is just a means to achieve the goal. I run through the basic line of reasoning with him. He listens. He's a fairly bright guy, Lou. You don't have to explain every little thing to him. At the end of it all, he agrees with me. So, what are you driving at? How do we know if we're making money? Well, there are a lot of ways. For the next few minutes, Lou goes on about total sales and market share and profitability and dividends paid to stockholders and so on. Finally, I hold up my hand. Let me put it this way: Suppose you're going to rewrite the textbooks. Suppose you don't have all those terms and you have to make them up as you go along. What would be the minimum number of measurements you would need in order to know if we are making money? Lou puts a finger alongside his face and squints through his bifocals at his shoe. Well. You'd have to have some kind of absolute measurement, something to tell you in dollars or yen or whatever, just how much money you've made. Something like net profit, right? Yeah, net profit. But you need more than just that, because an absolute measurement isn't going to tell you much. Oh yeah? If I know how much money I've made, why do I need to know anything else? You follow me? If I add up what I've made and I subtract my expenses and I get my net profit, what else do I need to know? I've made say ten million or twenty million or whatever. For a fraction of a second, Lou gets a glint in his eye, like I'm real dumb. All right, let's say you figure it out and you come up with ten million dollars net profit, an absolute measurement. Offhand, that sounds like a lot of money, like you really raked it in. But how much did you start with? You see, how much did it take to make that ten million dollars? Was it just a million dollars? Then you made ten times more money than you invested. Ten to one—that's pretty goddamned good. But let's say you invested a billion dollars. And you only made a lousy ten million bucks. That's pretty bad. Okay, okay. I was just asking to be sure. So you need a relative measurement too. You need something like return on investment (ROI), some comparison of the money made relative to the money invested. All right, but with those two, we ought to be able to tell how well the company's doing overall, shouldn't we? Lou nearly nods. Then he gets a faraway look. Well, I think about it too. You know, it is possible for a company to show net profit. And a good ROI, and still go bankrupt. You mean if it runs out of cash? Exactly. Bad cash flow is what kills most of the businesses that go under. So you have to count cash flow as a third measurement. Well, all right. I guess if you've got enough cash, then cash flow doesn't matter. But if you don't, nothing else matters. It's a measure of survival. Stay above the line, and you're okay. Go below, and you're dead. It's happening to us, isn't it? Uh huh. I knew it was coming. Just a matter of time. What about us? Did Peach say anything? They're thinking about closing us down. Will there be a consolidation? What he's really asking is whether he'll have a job. I honestly don't know, Lou. I imagine some people might be transferred to other plants or other divisions, but we didn't get into those kind of specifics. Lou takes a cigarette out of the pack in his shirt pocket. I watch him stamp the end of it repeatedly on the arm of his chair. Two lousy years to go before retirement. Hey, Lou, the worst it would probably mean for you would be an early retirement.、Oh, damn it! I don't want an early retirement. Look, I haven't given up yet. Al, if Peach says we're finished, he didn't say that. We've still got time. How much? Three months. Oh, forget it, Al. We'll never make it. I said I'm not giving up. Okay. For a minute, he doesn't say anything. I sit there knowing I'm not sure if I'm telling him the truth. All I've been able to do so far. Let's figure out that we have to make the plant make money. Fine, Rogo. Now, how do we do it? I hear Lou blow a heavy breath of smoke. Okay, Al. I'll give you all the help I can, but I'm going to need that help, Lou. And the first thing I need from you is to keep all this to yourself for the time being. If the word gets out, we won't be able to get anyone to lift a finger around here. Okay, but you know this won't stay a secret for long. I know he's right. So how do you plan on saving this place? The first thing I'm trying to do is get a clear picture of what we have to do to stay in business. Oh, so that's what all this stuff with the measurements is about. 
Listen, Al, don't waste your time with all that. A system is the system. You want to know what's wrong? I'll tell you what the problem is. And he does. For about an hour. Most of it I've heard before. It's the kind of thing everybody's heard. It's all the union's fault. If everybody would just work harder, nobody gives a damn about quality. Look at the Japanese. They know how to work. We've forgotten how, and so on and so on. He even tells me what sorts of self-flagellation we should administer in order to chasten ourselves. Mostly, Lou is just blowing off steam. That's why I let him talk. But I sit there wondering. Lou actually is a bright guy. We're all fairly bright. Unico has lots of bright, well-educated people on the payroll. And I sit here listening to Lou pronounce his opinions, which all sound good as they roll off his tongue, and I wonder why it is that we're slipping minute by minute toward oblivion if we're really so smart. Sometime after the sun has set, Lou decides to go home. I stay. After Lou has gone, I sit there at my desk with a pad of paper in front of me. On the paper, I write down the three measurements which Lou and I agreed are central to knowing if the company is making money. Net profit, ROI, and cash flow. I try to figure out if there is one of those three measurements which can be favored at the expense of the other two and allow me to pursue the goal. From experience, I happen to know there are a lot of games the people at the top can play. They can make the organization deliver a bigger net profit this year at the expense of net profit in years to come. Don't fund any R&D, for instance, that kind of thing. They can make a bunch of no-risk decisions and have any one of those measurements look great, while the others stink. Aside from that, the ratios between the three might have to vary according to the needs of the business. But then I sit back. If I were J. Bart Granby III, sitting high atop my company's corporate tower, and if my control over the company were secure, I wouldn't want to play any of those games. I wouldn't want to see one measurement increase while the other two were ignored. I would want to see increases in net profit and return on investment and cash flow, all three of them, and I would want to see all three of them increase all the time. Man, think of it. We'd really be making money if we could have all of the measurements go up simultaneously and forever. So this is the goal, to make money by increasing net profit while simultaneously increasing return on investment and simultaneously increasing cash flow. I write that down in front of me. I feel like I'm on a roll now. The pieces seem to be fitting together. I have found one clear-cut goal. I've worked out three related measurements to evaluate progress toward the goal. And I have come to the conclusion that simultaneous increases in all three measurements are what we ought to be trying to achieve. Not bad for a day's work. I think Jonah would be proud of me. Now then, I ask myself, how do I build a direct connection between the three measurements and what goes on in my plant? If I can find some logical relationship between our daily operations and the overall performance of the company, then I'll have a basis for knowing if something is productive or non-productive moving toward the goal or away from it. I go to the window and stare into the blackness. Half an hour later, it is as dark in my mind as it is outside the window. Running through my head are ideas about profit margins and capital investments and direct labor content, and it's all very conventional. It's the same basic line of thinking everybody has been following for a hundred years. If I follow it, I'll come to the same conclusions as everyone else, and that means I'll have no truer understanding of what's going on than I do now. I'm stuck. I turn away from the window. Behind my desk is a bookcase. I pull out a textbook, flip through it, put it back. Pull out another, flip through it, put it back. Finally, I've had it. It's late. I check my watch, and I'm shocked. It's past ten o'clock. All of a sudden, I realize I never called Julie to let her know I wasn't going to be home for dinner. She's really going to be pissed off at me. She always is when I don't call. I pick up the phone and dial. Julie answers. Hello. Hi. Guess we had a rotten day. Oh? So what else is new? It so happens my day wasn't too hot either. Okay, then we both had rotten days. Sorry I didn't call before. I got wrapped up in something. Well, I couldn't get a babysitter anyway. Then it dawns on me. Our postponed night out was supposed to be tonight. I'm sorry, Julie. I really am. I, I just completely slipped my mind. I made dinner. When you hadn't shown up after two hours, we ate without you. Yours is in the microwave if you want it. Thanks. Remember your daughter? The little girl who's in love with you? You don't have to be so sarcastic. She waited by the front window for you all evening until I made her go to bed. Why? 
She's got a surprise to show you. Listen, I'll be home in about an hour. No rush. She hangs up before I can say goodbye. Indeed, there is no point in rushing home at this stage of the game. I get my hard hat and glasses and take a walk out into the plant to pay a visit to Eddie, my second shift supervisor, and see how everything is going. When I get there, Eddie is not in his office. He's out dealing with something on the floor. I have him paged. Finally, I see him coming from way down at the other end of the plant. I watch him as he walks down. It's a five-minute wait. Something about Eddie has always irritated me. He's a competent supervisor. Not outstanding, but he's okay. His work is not what bothers me. It's something else. I watch Eddie's steady gait. Each step is very regular. Then it hits me. That's what irritates me about Eddie. It's the way he walks. Well, it's more than that. Eddie's walk is symbolic of the kind of person he is. He walks a little bit pigeon-toed. It's as if he's literally walking a straight, narrow line. His hands cross stiffly in front of him, seeming to point at each foot. And he does all this like he read in a manual someplace that this is how walking is supposed to be done. As he approaches, I'm thinking that Eddie has probably never done anything improper in his entire life, unless it was expected of him. Call him Mr. Regularity. We talk about some of the orders going through. As usual, everything is out of control. Eddie, of course, doesn't realize this. To him, everything is normal. And if it's normal, it must be right. He's telling me in elaborate detail about what is running tonight. Just for the hell of it, I feel like asking Eddie to define what he's doing tonight in terms of something like net profit. I want to ask him, Say, Eddie, how's our impact on ROI been in the last hour? By the way, what's your shift done to improve cash flow? Are we making money? It's not that Eddie hasn't heard of those terms. It's just that those concerns are not part of his world. His world is one measured in terms of parts per hour, man hours work, numbers of orders filled. He knows labor standards. He knows scrap factors. He knows run times. He knows shipping dates. Net profit, ROI, cash flow. That's just headquarters talk to Eddie. It's absurd to think I could measure Eddie's world by those three. For Eddie, there is only a vague association between what happens on his shift and how much money the company makes. Even if I could open Eddie's mind to the greater universe, it would still be very difficult to draw a clear connection between the values here on the plant floor and the values on the many floors of Unico headquarters. They're too different. In the middle of a sentence, Eddie notices I'm looking at him funny. Something wrong? Chapter 7 When I get home, the house is dark except for one light. I try to keep it quiet as I come in. True to her word, Julie has left me some dinner in the microwave. As I open the door to see what delectable treat awaits me, seems to be some variety of mystery meat. I hear a rustling behind me. I turn around, and there stands my little girl, Sharon, at the edge of the kitchen. Well, if it isn't Miss Muffet, how is the Tuffet these days? Oh, not bad. How come you're up so late? She comes forward holding a manila envelope. I sit down at the kitchen table and put her on my knee. She hands the envelope to me to open. It's my report card. No kidding. You have to look at it. You got all A's. That's terrific. It's very good, Sharon. I'm really proud of you. And I'll bet you were the only kid in your class to do this well. She nods. Then she has to tell me everything. I let her go on, and half an hour later, she's barely able to keep her eyes open. I carry her up to her bed. But tired as I am, I can't sleep. It's past midnight now. I sit in the kitchen, brooding and picking at dinner. My kid is getting A's in the second grade while I'm flunking out in business. Maybe I should just give up, use what time I've got to try to land another job. According to what Selwyn said, that's what everyone at headquarters is doing. Why should I be different? For a while, I try to convince myself that a call to a headhunter is the smart thing to do. But in the end, I can't. A job with another company would get Julie and me out of town, and maybe Fortune would bring me an even better position than I've got now, although I doubt it. My track record as a plant manager hasn't exactly been stellar. What turns me against the idea of looking for another job is I'd feel that we're running away, and I just can't do that. It's not that I feel I owe my life to the plant or the town or the company, but I do feel some responsibility. And aside from that, I've invested a big chunk of my life in Unico. I want that investment to pay off. 
three months is better than nothing for a last chance. My decision is, I'm going to do everything I can for the three months. But that decided, the big question arises, what the hell can I really do? I've already done the best I can with what I know. More of the same is not going to do any good. Unfortunately, I don't have a year to go back to school and restudy a lot of theory. I don't even have the time to read the magazines, papers, and reports piling up in my office. I don't have the time or the budget to screw around with consultants, making studies and all that crap. In any way, even if I did have the time and money, I'm not sure any of those would give me a much better insight than what I've got now. I have the feeling there are some things I'm not taking into account. If I'm ever going to get us out of this hole, I can't take anything for granted. I'm going to have to watch closely and think carefully about what is basically going on, take it one step at a time. I slowly realize that the only tools I have, limited as they may be, are my own eyes and ears, my own hands, my own voice, my own mind. That's about it. I am all I have. And the thought keeps coming to me. I don't know if that's enough. When I finally crawl into bed, Julie is a lump under the sheets. She is exactly the way I left her 21 hours ago. She's sleeping. Lying beside her on the mattress, still unable to sleep, I stare at the dark ceiling. That's when I decide to try to find Jonah again. Chapter 8 Two steps after rolling out of bed in the morning. I don't like moving at all. But in the midst of a morning shower, a memory of my predicament returns. When you've only got three months to work with, you don't have much time to waste feeling tired. I rush past Julie, who doesn't have much to say to me, and the kids, who already seem to sense that something is wrong, and head for the plant. The whole way there, I'm thinking about how to get in touch with Jonah. That's the problem. Before I can ask for his help, I've got to find him. The first thing I do when I get to the office is have Fran barricade the door against the hordes massing outside for frontal attack. Just as I reach my desk, Fran buzzes me. Bill Peach is on the line. Great. Yes, Bill? Don't you ever walk out of one of my meetings again. Do you understand me? Yes, Bill. Now, because of your untimely absence yesterday, we've got some things to go over. A few minutes later, I've pulled Lou into the office to help me with the answers. Then, Peach has dragged in Ethan Frost, and we're having a four-way conversation. And that's the last chance I have to think about Jonah for the rest of the day. After I'm done with Peach, half a dozen people come into my office for a meeting that has been postponed since last week. The next thing I know, I look out the window, and it's dark outside. The sun has set, and I'm still in the middle of my sixth meeting of the day. After everyone has gone... I take care of some paperwork. It's past seven when I hop in the car to go home. While waiting in traffic for a long light to turn green, I finally have the opportunity to remember how the day began. That's when I get back to thinking about Jonah. Two blocks later, I remember my old address book. I pull over at a gas station and use the payphone to call Julie. Hi, it's me. Listen, I've got to go over to my mother's for something. I'm not sure how long I'll be, so... Why don't you go ahead and eat without me? The next time that you want dinner... Look, I don't give me any grief, Julie. This is important. There is a second of silence before I hear the click. It's always a little strange going back to the old neighborhood, because everywhere I look is some kind of memory waiting just out of sight of my mind's eye. I pass the corner where I had the fight with Bruno Krebsky. I drive down the street where we played ball summer after summer. I see the alley where I made out for the first time with Angelina. I go past the utility pole upon which I grazed the fender of my old man's Chevy and subsequently had to work two months in the store for free to pay for the repair. All that stuff. The closer I get to the house, the more memories come crowding in and the more I get this feeling that's kind of warm and uncomfortably tense. Julie hates to come here. When we first moved to town, we used to come down every Sunday to see my mother and Danny and his wife Nicole. But there got to be too many fights about it, so we don't make the trip much anymore. I park the Buick by the curb in front of the steps to my mother's house. It's a narrow, brick row house, about the same as any other on the street. Down at the corner is my old man's store, the one my brother owns today. The lights are off down there. Danny closes at six. Getting out of my car, I feel conspicuous in my suit and tie. 
My mother opens the door. Oh, my God. Who's dead? Nobody died, Mom. It's Julie, isn't it? Did she leave you? No, not yet. Oh, well, let me see. It isn't Mother's Day. Mom, I'm just here to look for something. Look for something? Look for what? Come in, come in. You're letting all the cold inside. Boy, you gave me a scare. Here you are in town and you never come to see me anymore. What's the matter? You're too important now for your old mother. No, of course not, Mom. I've been very busy at the plant. Busy, busy. You hungry? No, listen. I don't want to put you to any trouble. Oh, it's no trouble. I got some CD. I can heat it up. You want a salad, too? No. Listen, a cup of coffee will be fine. I just need to find my old address book. It's the one I had when I was in college. Do you know where it might be? Your old address book. Hmm. How about some cake? Danny brought some day old over last night from the store. No, thanks, Mom. I'm fine. It's probably in with all my old notebooks and stuff from school. Notebooks? Yeah. You know where they might be? Well, no, but I put all that stuff up in the attic. Okay, I'll go look there. Coffee in hand, I head for the stairs leading to the second floor and up into the attic. Or it might all be in the basement. Three hours later, after dusting through the drawings I made in the first grade, my model airplanes, an assortment of musical instruments my brother once attempted to play in his quest to become a rock star, my yearbooks, four steamer trunks filled with receipts from my father's business, old love letters, old snapshots, old newspapers, old you name it. The address book is still at large. We give up on the attic. My mother prevails upon me to have some ziti. Then we try the basement. Oh, look! Did you find it? No, but here's a picture of your Uncle Paul before he was arrested for embezzlement. Did I ever tell you that story? After another hour, we've gone through everything, and I've had a refresher course in all there is to know about Uncle Paul. Where the hell could it be? Well, I don't know, unless it could be in your old room. We go upstairs to the room I used to share with Danny. Over in the corner is the old desk where I used to study when I was a kid. I open the top drawer, and of course... There it is. Mom, I need to use your phone. My mother's phone is located on the landing of the stairs between the floors of the house. It's the same phone that was installed in 1936, after my father began to make enough money from the store to afford one. I sit down on the steps, a pad of paper on my lap, briefcase at my feet. I pick up the receiver, which is heavy enough to bludgeon a burglar into submission. I dial the number, the first of many. It's one o'clock by now, but I'm calling Israel, which happens to be on the other side of the world from us, and vice versa, which roughly means that their days are our nights, our nights are their mornings, and consequently, one in the morning is not such a bad time to call. Before long, I've reached a friend I made at the university, someone who knows what's become of Jonah. He finds me another number to call. By two o'clock, I've got the tablet of paper on my lap, covered with numbers I've scribbled down and I'm talking to some people who work with Jonah. I convince one of them to give me the number where I can reach him. By three o'clock, I found him. He's in London. After several transfers here and there, across some office of some company, I'm told that he will call me when he gets in. I don't really believe that, but I doze by the phone. And 45 minutes later, it rings. Alex? Yes, Jonah. I got the message you had called. Right. You remember our meeting in O'Hare? Yes, of course I remember it. And I presume you have something to tell me now. I freeze for a moment. Then I realize he's referring to his questions. What is the goal? Right. Well? My answer seems so ludicrously simple. I am suddenly afraid that it must be wrong, that he will laugh at me. But I blurt it out. The goal of a manufacturing organization is to make money. And everything else we do is a means to achieve the goal. But Jonah doesn't laugh at me. Very good, Alex. Very good. Thanks. But see, the reason I called was to ask you a question that's kind of related to the discussion we had at O'Hare. What is the problem? Well, in order to know if my plant is helping the company make money, I have to have some kind of measurements, right? That's correct. And I know that up in the executive suite at company headquarters, they've got measurements like net profit and return on investment and cash flow, which they apply to the overall organization to check on progress toward the goal. Uh, yeah. But where, but where I am, down at the plant level, those measurements don't mean very much. And the measurements I use inside the plant, well, I'm not absolutely sure, but I don't think they're really telling the whole story. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. So how can I know whether what's happening in my plant is truly productive or non-productive? 
Uh, tell him I'll be in as soon as I'm through with this call. Alex, uh, you, you have hit upon something very important. I only have uh, time to talk to you for a few minutes, but perhaps I can suggest a few things which might help you. You see, there's more than one way to express the goal. Do you understand? The goal stays the same, but you can state it in different ways, ways which mean the same thing as those two words, making money. Yeah, okay, so I can say the goal is to increase net profit while simultaneously increasing both ROI and cash flow. And that's the equivalent of saying the goal is to make money. Exactly. One expression is the equivalent of the other. But as you have discovered, those uh, conventional measurements you use to express the goal do not lend themselves very well uh, to the daily operations of the manufacturing organization. In fact, that's why I developed a different set of measurements. What kind of measurements are those? They are measurements which express the goal of making money perfectly well, but which also permit you to develop operational rules for running your plant. There are three of them. Their names are uh, throughput, inventory, and operational expense. <laughs> Those all sound familiar. Yes, but their definitions are not. In fact, you will probably want to write them down. Mm, okay, uh, go ahead. Throughput is the rate at which the system generates money through sales. But what about production? Wouldn't it be more correct to say... No, <laughs> through sales, not production. If you produce something but don't sell it, it's not throughput. Got it? Yeah, um, right. I thought maybe, because I'm plant manager, I could substitute... Alex, let me tell you something. These definitions, even though they may sound simple, are worded very precisely. And they should be. A measurement not clearly defined is worse than useless, so I suggest you consider them carefully as a group, and remember that if you want to change one of them, you will have to change at least one of the others as well. Well, okay. Uh, the next measurement is inventory. Inventory is uh, all the money that the system has invested in purchasing things which it intends to sell. I write it down, but I'm wondering about it because it's very different from the traditional definition of inventory. And the last measurement? Operational expense. Now, operational expense is all the money the system spends in order to turn inventory into throughput. Okay, but what about the labor invested in inventory? You make it sound as though labor is operational expense. Judge it according to the definitions. But the value added to the product by direct labor has to be a part of inventory, doesn't it? It might be, but it doesn't have to be. Why do you say that? Very simple. I decided to define it this way because I believe it's better not to take the value added into account. It eliminates the confusion over whether a dollar spent is an investment or an expense. That's why I defined inventory and operational expense the way I just gave you. Oh. Okay, but how do I relate those measurements to my plant? Everything you manage in your plant is covered by those measurements. Everything? But going back to our original conversation, how do I use these measurements to evaluate productivity? Well, obviously you have to express the goal in terms of the measurements. Hold on a second, Alex. I'll be there in a minute. So how do I express the goal? Alex, I really have to run. And I know you are smart enough to figure it out on your own. All you have to do is think about it. Just remember we are always talking about the organization as a whole, not about the manufacturing department or about one plant or about one department within the plant. We are not concerned with local optimums. Local optimums? I'll have to explain it to you some other time. But Jonah, this isn't enough. Even if I can define the goal with these measurements, how do I go about deriving operational rules for running my plant? Uh, give me a phone number where you can be reached. 203-624-9026. Okay, Alex, I really do have to go now. Right, and thanks for uh, talking to me. I sit there on the steps for some time, staring at the three definitions. At some point, I close my eyes. 
When I open them again, I see beams of sunlight below me on the living room rug. I haul myself upstairs to my old room in the bed I had when I was a kid. I sleep the rest of the morning with my torso and limbs painstakingly arranged around the lumps in my mattress. Five hours later, I wake up feeling like a waffle. Chapter 9 It's eleven o'clock when I wake up. Startled by what time it is, I fall onto my feet and head for the phone to call Fran so she can let everyone know I haven't gone AWOL. Mr. Rogo's office. Hi, it's me. Well, hello, stranger. We were just about ready to start checking the hospitals for you. Think you'll make it in today? Uh, yeah. I just had something unexpected come up with my mother. Kind、oh. of an emergency. Well. I hope everything's all right. Yeah, it's、uh, taken care of now, more or less. Anything going on that I should know about? Well, let's see. Two of the testing machines in G Isle are down, and Bob Donovan wants to know if we can ship without testing. Tell him absolutely not. Okay, and somebody from marketing is calling about a late shipment. Oh, God. And there was a fist fight last night on second shift.、Uh, Lou still needs to talk to you about some numbers for Bill Peach. And a reporter called this morning asking when the plant was going to close. Terrific. I told him he'd have to talk with you. And a woman from corporate communications called about shooting a videotape here about productivity、mm. and robots with Mr. Granby.、Oh, no, with Granby? That's what she said. What's the name and number? Sally Rice, 8675309. Okay, thanks. See you later. I call the woman at corporate right away. I can hardly believe the chairman of the board is going to come to the plant. There must be some mistake. I mean, by the time Granby's limo pulls up to the gate, the whole plant might be closed. But the woman confirms it. They want to shoot Granby here sometime in the middle of next month. We need a robot as a suitable background for Mr. Granby's remarks. So why did you pick Barrington? The director saw a slide of one of yours, and he likes the color. He thinks Mr. Granby will look good standing in front of it. Oh, I see. Have you talked to Bill Peach about this? No, I didn't think there was any need for that. Why? Is there a problem? You might want to run this past Bill in case he has any other suggestions. But it's up to you. Just let me know when you have an exact date so I can notify the union and have the area cleaned up. Fine. I'll be in touch. So, he likes the color. What was all that about on the phone just now? We're sitting together at the table. She's obliged me to have something to eat before I leave. I tell her about Granby coming. Well, that sounds like a feather in your cap. The head man. What's his name again? Granby. He's coming all the way to the factory to see you. It must be an honor. Yeah, it is in a way, but actually, he's just coming to have his picture taken with one of my robots. Robot? Like from out of space? No, not from outer space. These are industrial robots. They're not like the ones on television. Oh, do they have faces? No, not yet. They mostly have arms, which do things like welding, stacking materials, spray painting, and so on. They're run by computer, and you can program them to do different jobs. Mom nods, still trying to picture what these robots are. So why's this Granby guy want to have his picture taken with a bunch of robots who don't even have faces? I guess because they're the latest thing, and he wants to tell everybody in the corporation that we ought to be using more of them, so that. I stop and glance away for a second, and see Jonah sitting there smoking his cigar. So that what? Ah,、uh, so that we can increase productivity. And Jonah says, "Have they really increased productivity at your plant?" Sure they have, I say. We had what? A thirty-six percent improvement in one area. Jonah puffs his cigar. Is something the matter? Ah,、uh, I just remembered something. That's all. What? Something bad? No. An earlier conversation I had with the man I talked to last night. Alex, what's wrong? Come on, you can tell me. I know something's wrong. You show up out of the blue on my doorstep. You're calling people all over the place in the middle of the night. What is it? You see, Mom, the plant isn't doing so well, and、uh, well, we're not making any money. Your plant is not making any money. But you're telling me about this fancy guy, Grand, becoming, and these robot things, whatever they are, and you're not making any money. That's what I said, Mom. Don't these robot things work, Mom? If they don't work, maybe the store will take them back. Mom, will you forget about the robots? I was just trying to help. 
Yeah, I know you were. Thanks, really. Thanks for everything, okay? I've got to get going now. I've really got a lot of work to do. I stand up and go to get my briefcase. My mother follows. Did I get enough to eat? Would I like a snack to take with me for later in the day? Finally, she takes my sleeve and holds me in one place. Listen to me, Al. Maybe you've got some problems. I know you do. But this running all over the place, staying up all night, isn't good for you. You've got to stop worrying. It's not going to help you. Look what worrying did to your father. It killed him. But Mom, he was run over by a bus. So, if he hadn't been so busy worrying, he would have looked before he crossed the street. Yeah, well, Mom. You may have a point, but it's more complicated than you think. I mean it. No worrying. And this Granby fellow, if he's making trouble for you, you let me know. I'll call him and tell him what a worker you are. And who should know better than a mother? You leave him to me. I'll straighten him out. I smile. I put my arm around her shoulders. I bet you would, Mom. You know I would. I tell Mom to call me as soon as her phone bill arrives in the mail, and I'll come over and pay it. I give her a hug and a kiss goodbye, but I'm out of there. I walk out into the daylight and get into the Buick. For a moment, I consider going straight to the office. But a glance at the wrinkles in my suit and a rub of the stubble on my chin convinces me to go home and clean up first. Once I'm on my way, I keep hearing Jonah's voice saying to me, So your company is making 36% more money from your plant just by installing some robots. Incredible. And I remember that I was the one who was smiling. I was the one who thought he didn't understand the realities of manufacturing. Now I feel like an idiot. Yes, the goal is to make money. I know that now. And yes, Jonah, you're right. Productivity did not go up 36% just because we installed some robots. For that matter, did it go up at all? Are we making any more money because of the robots? And the truth is, I don't know. I find myself shaking my head. But I wonder how Jonah knew. He seemed to know right away that productivity hadn't increased. There were those questions he asked. One of them, I remember as I'm driving, was whether we had been able to sell any more products as a result of having the robots. Another one was whether we had reduced the number of people on the payroll. Then he had wanted to know if inventories had gone down. Three basic questions. When I get home, Julie's car is gone. She's out someplace, which is just as well. She's probably furious at me. And I simply do not have time to explain right now. After I'm inside, I open my briefcase to make a note of those questions, and I see the list of measurements Jonah gave me last night. From the second I glance at those definitions again, it's obvious. The questions match the measurements. That's how Jonah knew. He was using the measurements in the crude form of simple questions to see if his hunch about the robots was correct. Did we sell any more products, i.e., did our throughput go up? Did we lay off anybody? Did our operational expense go down? And the last, exactly what he said. Did our inventories go down? With that observation, it doesn't take me long to see how to express the goal through Jonah's measurements. I'm still a little puzzled by the way he worded the definitions, but aside from that, it's clear that every company would want to have its throughput go up. Every company would also want the other two, inventory and operational expense, to go down if at all possible. And certainly, it's best if they all occur simultaneously, just as with the trio that Lou and I found. So, the way to express the goal is this. Increase throughput while simultaneously reducing both inventory and operating expense. That means if the robots have made throughput go up and the other two go down, they've made money for the system. But what's really happened since they started working? I don't know what effect, if any, they've had on throughput. But off the top of my head, I know inventories have generally increased over the past six or seven months, although I can't say for sure if the robots are to blame. The robots have increased our depreciation because they're new equipment, but they haven't directly taken away any jobs from the plant. We simply shifted people around, which means the robots had to increase operational expense. Okay, but efficiencies have gone up because of the robots, so maybe that's been our salvation. When efficiencies go up, the cost per part has to come down. But did the cost really come down? How could the cost per part go down 
if operational expense went up. By the time I make it to the plant, it's one o'clock, and I still haven't thought of a satisfactory answer. I'm still thinking about it as I walk through the office doors. The first thing I do is stop by Lou's office. Have you got a couple of minutes? Are you kidding? I've been looking for you all morning. He reaches for a pile of paper on the corner of his desk. I know it's got to be the report he has to send up to division. <laughs> no, I don't want to talk about that right now. I've got something more important on my mind. More important than this report for Peach? Infinitely more important than that. Have a seat. What can I do for you? After those robots out on the floor came online, and we got most of the bugs out and all that, what happened to our sales? What kind of question is that? A smart one, I hope. I need to know if the robots had any impact on our sales, and specifically, if there was any increase after they came online. Increase? Just about all of our sales have been level or in a downhill slide since last year. Well, would you mind just checking? Not at all. Got all the time in the world. Lou opens his desk drawer, and after flipping through some files, starts pulling out handfuls of reports, charts, and graphs. We both start leafing through. But we find that in every case where a robot came online, there was no increase in sales for any product for which they made parts, not even the slightest blip on the curve. For the heck of it, we also checked the shipments made from the plant, but there was no increase there either. In fact, the only increase is in overdue shipments. They've grown rapidly over the last nine months. Lou looks up from the graphs. Al, I don't know what you're trying to prove, but if you want to broadcast some success story on how the robots are going to save the plant with increased sales, the evidence just doesn't exist. The data practically say the opposite. That's exactly what I was afraid of. What do you mean? I'll explain it in a minute. Let's look at inventories. I want to find out what happened to our work in process on parts produced by the robots. I can't help you there. I don't have anything on inventories by part number. Okay. Let's get Stacy in on this. Stacy Potsenick manages inventory control for the plant. Lou makes a call and pulls her out of another meeting. Stacy is a woman in her early 40s. She's tall, thin, and brisk in her manner. Her hair is black with strands of gray, and she wears big round glasses. She is always dressed in jackets and skirts. Never have I seen her in a blouse with any kind of lace, ribbon, or frill. I know almost nothing about her personal life. She wears a ring, but she's never mentioned a husband. She rarely mentions anything about her life outside the plant. I do know she works hard. When she comes in to see us, I ask her about work in process on those parts passing through the robot areas. Do you want exact numbers? No, we just need to know the trends. Well, I can tell you without looking that inventories went up on those parts. Recently? No, it's been happening since late last summer, around the end of the third quarter. And you can't blame me for it, even though everyone always does, because I fought it every step of the way. What do you mean? You remember, don't you? Or maybe you weren't here then. But when the reports came in, we found the robots in welding were only running at something like 30% efficiency. And the other robots weren't much better. Nobody would stand for that. Lou? We had to do something. Frost would have had my head if I hadn't spoken up. Those things were brand new and very expensive. They'd never pay for themselves in the projected time if we kept them at 30%. Okay. Hold on a minute. What did you do then? What could I do? I had to release more materials to the floor in all the areas feeding the robots. Giving the robots more to produce increased their efficiencies. But ever since then, we've been ending each month with a surplus of those parts. But the important thing was that efficiencies did go up. Nobody can find fault with us on that. I'm not sure of that at all anymore. Stacy, why are we getting that surplus? How come we aren't consuming those parts? Well... In a lot of cases, we don't have any orders to fill at present, which would call for those parts. And in the cases where we do have orders, we just can't seem to get enough of the other parts we need. How come? Well, you'd have to ask Bob Donovan about that. Lou, let's have Bob paged. Bob comes into the office with a smear of grease on his white shirt over the bulge of his beer gut, and he's talking nonstop about what's going on with the breakdown of the automatic testing machines. Bob, forget about that for now. Something else wrong? Yeah, there is. We've just been talking about our local celebrities, the robots. <laughs> what are you worried about them for? The robots work pretty good now. We're not so sure about that. Stacy tells me we've got an excess of parts built by the robots, but in some instances, we can't get enough of certain other parts to assemble and ship our orders. It isn't that we can't get enough parts. It's more that we can't seem to get them when we need them. And that's true even with a lot of the robot parts. We'll have a pile of something like, um, say, uh, CD50 sit around for months waiting for control boxes. And we'll get the control boxes, but we won't have something else. 
Finally, we get to something else, and we build the order and ship it. Next thing you know, you're looking around for a CD-50, and you can't find any. We'll have tons of CD-45s and 80s, but no 50s. So we wait. And by the time we get to 50s again, all the control boxes are gone. And so on, and so on, and so on. But Stacy, you said...